What's the biggest problem when it comes to building out a home lab? The cost? The space? The constant need to build a wall of electronics to hide your inadequacies? No, it's taking it with you when you leave the house. Okay, who are we kidding? You don't leave the house. In all seriousness though, there are instances where people may need a mobile home lab, whether that's due to living on the road, traveling for work, or in my case, for fun. That's right, you fun-hating arch users. People are allowed to do shit for fun. So that's what we're gonna do today. Build out a portable home lab that we can take anywhere. Anywhere. All right, so for this to be a proper portable home lab, we need to check off a few boxes. It needs to fit in a normal ass bag that you'd actually carry around. It needs to power itself, meaning that it can function if you find yourself too far away from an outlet for some weird reason. It needs proper networking, so like the ability to set up DNS, have multiple hardware to clients, VPN access, shit like that. It needs to be accessible from the outside world, so theoretically, if I threw it in the woods and went home, I'd still be able to access it. And finally, it needs to be able to run services, because what good is a home lab without a server running Docker? Oh, and bonus round? It needs to be able to go 25 miles per hour. You'll see. So how do we accomplish this? Well, with all of this, let's take a look at the hardware. At the core of this monstrosity, I needed a server, and I wanted the server to have a nice balance of power and power efficiency. I ended up going with this B-Link SER5, which has a six core, 12 thread Ryzen 5 5500U, 16 gigabytes of DDR4, and a 500 gigabyte NVMe drive. I paid $280 on Amazon, which I think is a really good deal. It did have space for another 2.5 inch SATA drive, so I threw a two terabyte SSD I had laying around in there. With power usage sitting around 10 watts, it was that nice power balance that we we're looking for. For networking, we're going with what I think is one of the best travel routers in the game, and that is the GLINet Barrel AX. It's a compact device running a custom skin of OpenWRT, which gives us all kinds of fancy networking features like AdGuard, VPN server and clients, local DNS, multiple WANs, and even Wi-Fi 6. I did a tiny router showdown video that featured this guy, so go and check that out if you haven't seen it. The main feature though is the ability to plug in my phone and use the cellular 5G network as a WAN, so anywhere I have cell coverage, I have networking for my home lab. To give us a few more ports to connect client devices, I threw in this cheap 5 port gigabit dumb switch. Probably like $15, depending on the economy or something. Definitely not necessary, but hey, None of this is so f it. All right, we need to power these jabronis. So I'm going with an Anchor 533 power station. This is an old model, so if you wanted to replicate this, then they have the newer 535, that's 500 watts, 512 watt hours, and costs, take a guess, $600. I'm kidding, yeah, it's $500. You can maybe get by with something smaller, both physically and power-wise. It's 100% dependent on your use case, so, with this one, if my lab uses 50 watts, then theoretically I could get 10 hours out of this thing without needing to head back to civilization to juice back up. Now for the most important part, this thing needs to go 25 miles per hour. And while I admit I can run pretty fast, I'm definitely not as fast as this thing. Yep, it's an e-bike. Wait. Did you just insert some arbitrary requirement for your mobile home lab just so some company would give you a free e-bike? This is the Cyrusher Komana, a fat tire step-through e-bike with a beastly 750 watt motor. Something you may not know about me, I'm a bit of an e-bike expert. I've ridden more than two e-bikes in my life. Yeah, I've ridden three. And I'll be honest with you guys, this is the nicest one I've ridden. Sorry, Terry. The unboxing experience was honestly easy enough. I just had to clip the handlebars on and then put the front wheel on. One thing that stuck out to me was the dual front and rear suspension, which is also adjustable. The ride is smooth as hell, even in the treacherous off-roading conditions in the easement behind my house. Look, there was even a fire. Operation of the e-bike is pretty straightforward once you find the power button on the underside of the left handlebar. The 3.7 inch LCD screen lights up and displays one of the six modes the bike can be in from off, 
which offers no pedal assist, two eco, low, normal, high, and power, all having increasing levels of pedal assist and max speeds. And for all of you that want a bike but don't want to pedal, good news. There's a throttle. In full power mode, I got up to 25 miles per hour, which is fast enough for most people, but not fast enough to outrun my inner demons. The website says it can get up to 50 miles of range on a full charge. I uh, didn't test this because I didn't want to ride 50 miles, but I did go on about a 10 mile ride. And once I was done, I had about 72% of battery left. So math. Now, obviously they did send this to me, but I have no reason to lie to you guys because I have zero obligation to this company. They didn't make me sign a contract and they didn't pay me. With that said, this thing is freaking solid. You know that feeling you get when you're using a product and you can just feel that it's a quality product? That's what I experienced here. The only real complaint I have is that I did have to adjust the handlebar grips for a more comfortable ride, which was kind of a pain. But overall, this is a really nice bike. So if you're in the market for one, check it out using the link in the description below. And they do have other models available if this doesn't fit your vibe. So head on over to the Cyrusher website and pick one out. All right, back to our normal turbo nerd content. I loaded the Proxmox onto the B-Link for no other reason than it's my go-to server OS. Pick whatever you want, I don't care. From there, I created an LXC container to host Docker, which would be the base for nearly everything we want to run on here. I did also spin up some VMs, which is cool to be able to locally remote into a few VMs to get some work done. The Ryzen chip on here has no problem handling everything, which isn't necessarily surprising for a modern CPU. What surprises me more is the power draw. To make everything more accessible back home, I'm utilizing Tailscale, which is a self-hosted VPN service that's rock solid and allows any of my devices to communicate with each other no matter where they are. I'm actually just running this in Docker using a Docker Compose YAML file, so that setup is no real issue. Since Tailscale works on any platform, Windows, Mac, or Linux, I can communicate directly with my container from my MacBook, even when they're on different networks. Now, if you want to access other devices in the same subnet as a Tailscale connected device, that's no problem either. When running the Tailscale up command, just add the advertised routes parameter with the subnets you'd like to expose and boom, they've been exposed faster than you after a few shots of tequila. If you're running it in Docker like I am, just add an extra environment variable and same concept. There is actually one more step. The first time you do this, you'll have to log into the Tailscale site and allow that subnet to be exposed. Cool, check that off the list, kind of. The issue we still have is that while everything hosted in my mobile home lab is available from any other network, it's only if you're running the Tailscale app. What if I wanna host a website that anyone can access? Well, we're getting a little jank with this. I host a few things in my actual home lab and use Nginx Proxy Manager to point to each service. What if I ran Tailscale on my Nginx Proxy Manager client? This would mean that we could now point to anything hosted on the mobile home lab directly from my actual home lab. Sure, this means there's an extra hop, but who cares? It works. If you wanna see how I set up Nginx Proxy Manager to act as my reverse proxy, go check out my video on that. All right, that's enough network stuff. I'm bored with it. Now at this point in the video, I was gonna go through all my services, but then I realized everyone's needs are so vastly different that it honestly doesn't matter. But then I realized it's my video and I can do whatever I want. So let's talk about what services I'm running on here. Some cool, some not so much, but obviously we are running Portainer because you know the rules, everybody say it with me. Docker without Portainer is like foot fungus. I don't want it. I actually just found out last week that there's a community-backed repository for apps within Portainer, so I'm using that and basically went ham on the apps. We've got Plex, we've got File Browser, we've got Duplicati, we've got Pi-hole, we've even got a Minecraft server. Yeah, we've got a lot of apps and honestly, they all run about as expected. Now make sure if you are running high bandwidth apps like file sharing or media serving, then you have a really good data plan because uh, yeah, you're gonna need it. Now to put this to the ultimate test, I'm literally gonna leave this in the woods and go back to my house and check out and see how Plex will run from essentially being hosted in the woods. Now, why would you do this? I, 
I don't know, man. You click the video, so that's on you. Now, this is really gonna be dependent on your cellular speed, so let's check out and see what we are getting right now. Okay, about 14, 15 megabits per second. Not great, but I think just enough to get us to where we need to go. Let's find out. And yes, I'm actually leaving this entire thing in the woods. So the last step before I head home is to actually plug my phone into the GLINet router so it can use my phone as a hotspot slash WAN. All right, back inside where the air condition is, where I belong on my Windows machine, that is connected with the TailScale app back to my PC in the woods. Now I will admit when I was coming back, I moved the setup to a bit of a clearer spot to get a better cellular signal. And we were getting around 100 megabits per second down, which is significantly better. So to show you that I'm connected, let's go ahead and open up Portainer, which is connected on that 192.168.8 subnet that we exposed through TailScale. And to show you that I'm not even on that subnet, if I run a little IP config, you'll see that we are not on that subnet at all. We are connecting through TailScale. And I'll go one step further and if I go into my TailScale admin panel, you can see we have three devices connected, one being the PC that I'm on, one being the PC that is sitting out in the woods, and another one that is running in my home lab. So PC that is out in the woods is given this internal IP through TailScale. We can actually copy that. And instead of using that 192.168 IP address, we could use that internal TailScale IP as well. So if I paste that in, same thing. I can connect via that IP directly through TailScale, which is pretty cool. And we have access to all our containers just as if this was on our local network. Now, like I said, we are going to try a play a movie, so let's do that. Okay, here we are in Plex. Make sure we are on my Travel Boy, which is the one that's connected through TailScale. Go to Movies, that's what I'm on. And uh, we have Happy Gilmore and Toy Story 4. Pretty much the same movie. So if I go up here to Happy Gilmore, click play, resume. Okay, and here you can see that it works. I may be doing some weird zooming in or blurring so that this doesn't get demonetized. Um, but yeah, it seems to be running pretty well. Now, this is gonna be dependent on a few things. Obviously, the bandwidth you have on your cellular connection, the bandwidth you have on your cellular connection and the bit rate of the content that you are streaming. So higher bit rate, higher resolution stuff is going to be harder to stream. Uh, 3,500 kilobits per second, so not that bad. So yeah, pretty cool to be able to watch movies directly from a server that is literally sitting out in the woods somewhere. Obviously with a decent cellular connection, but still pretty cool. And I did also mention that we are running a Minecraft server, so uh, let's connect to that. Okay, so I did set this up before, but if we go to edit that server, you can see we are accessing it over the 192.168.8 subnet. Obviously, it found it, that's good, let's connect. Okay, we are in, we are playing Minecraft on the server that very appropriately is hosted somewhere out in the wilderness. Ah, okay, relax, dude. I'm just trying to show my viewers that I can play with you guys. Ah, no, I'm dying. Okay, you guys get the picture. It's doable. It does feel like there's maybe a little bit of latency, but honestly not too terrible. Definitely doable. So that's my setup. Is this something that I'm gonna use regularly? No, I mean, I'm gonna use the e-bike. That thing's awesome, but don't get me wrong, that's a totally usable setup. I'm just a hobbit who doesn't leave the house, so I don't really need it. But for those of you living on the road or for those of you that travel a lot, something like this could work for you. And if you wanna deploy something like at your parents' house or a friend's house as a backup, then a compact portable system like this might be the way to go. Total cost for the whole setup was about $900 with most of that coming from the portable power station. Let me know if this inspired you in any way down in the comments. And actually, let me know either way. Comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. One thing to note, though, 
Is that if you want a completely mobile home lab, but don't want to do any of this, then the cloud is also an option. Go check out American Cloud using my referral link in the description below for a free $10 credit when trying it out. That's all I have. Drop a like if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to see more shenanigans. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my 750 watt e-bike that I like to ride. Wait, you guys are the shizzle. And if you're still watching, I appreciate you too. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the next one.